Okay, uh, so welcome everyone to the fifth presentation in this semester's Perspectives in International Development Seminar Series. I'm Terry Tucker and it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Bram Goverts. Dr. Goverts is Director of the Integrated Development Program and Regional Representative for the Americas at the International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center, CIMIT. In recognition of his expertise and significant contributions to sustainable agriculture in food systems in Mexico and globally, he was appointed as a Cornell University Andrew D. White Professor at Large for the period 2019 to 2025. This is a distinction granted to individuals whose work in science, education, social sciences, literature, and the creative arts uh, uh, has had great impact in international visibility. Following their six-year appointments, A.D. White professors at large are considered distinguished and lifetime members of the Cornell University academic community. At CIMIT, uh, Bram has been instrumental in developing a project portfolio that integrates innovations in maize, in wheat production systems that minimize adverse environmental impacts. He's skilled at assembling effective multidisciplinary science and development teams to integrate sustainable multi-stakeholder and sector strategies that generate innovation and change in agri-food systems. These initiatives have resulted in improved nutrition, natural resource conservation and national and international resilience and security. In 2014, Bram Goverts received the Norman E. Borlaug Award for Field Research and Application, a prestigious award endowed by the Rockefeller Foundation and awarded by the World Food Prize Foundation for leading the Mazagro project and finding innovative ways of applying science to improve the productivity and resilience of small and medium-sized maize and wheat farmers in Mexico. He was very recently elected a fellow in the American Society of Agronomy, that organization's most prestigious recognition. Bram holds a PhD in bioscience engineering with a focus on soil science, a master's degree in soil conservation and tropical agriculture, and a bachelor's degree in bioscience engineering, all from Catholic University Leuven, Belgium. Thank you for joining us today, Bram. We look forward to your talk. Thank you, and, and thanks, Terry, for this, uh, this introduction and for the opportunity. Also, thanks for all of you who are connecting from your respective uh, sites of work and reflection, which is a bit different than being on the beautiful campus uh, with you in New York. And also, I want to thank Johannes for, for being such a great contact point and ambassador within the Cornell uh, uh, community. Uh, so I'm, I'm sorry that we cannot meet life, and it has changed our our way of thinking and I think in that sense also this presentation is probably a bit different than uh, what I would have presented if this would not have happened uh, and also I took this presentation a bit more as a wide uh, uh, professor so going beyond the the natural sciences and the, the the hard sciences a little bit more to the strategic elements uh, I will try to present uh, 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 and then leave uh, Q and A's at the end if you are if you are comfortable uh, with that so first and uh, first and foremost, uh, I, uh, my day-to-day -day job is with CIMIT. Most of you know probably the International Mason Wheat Improvement Center, or in English, that ends up uh, adds up to the acronym uh, CIMIT. CIMIT is known globally for having projects in 40 countries. We are uh, headquartered in uh, in Mexico, and from Mexico, we send. 70% uh, of all wheat varieties grown in the world and 50% of all maize varieties come from CIMIT's effort. We have offices in uh, many, many countries and uh, projects uh, in even more. And we are looking at teaming up with the centers of excellence like, uh, like Cornell for uh, uh, joint research, but also that we can uh, uh, develop the new generation of leaders that can uh, help us as a world to respond to the uh, SDGs or Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, in that sense, uh, uh, I, I wanted to do a reflection with you today. And the reflection that I was wondering about when I started this process for this seminar was basically saying 50 years ago, uh, Norman Borlaug received the Nobel Peace Prize for developing a transformational response to uh, what back then was the crisis. 
And we have historically been looking at that of having saved a billion lives, but obviously also of uh, having to correct some of the negative impacts like uh, maybe uh, too much fertilizer use or not enough uh, system thinking or not enough cycling thinking. So I was wondering after this uh, disruptive event and the world we live in today, when historians pick up their pen many, many years uh, later than today, uh, and, and what, what will they say when they, when they describe what we were doing when we were walking on this, uh, on this globe? Especially if we look at this hunger map for 2020, I think it is uh, still incredible. If we look at the numbers, as soon as you're ye a yellow country here, you are in trouble because it means chronic hunger is uh, uh, above 15% uh, uh, so, uh, of your uh, population. So you can see countries like Mexico and of course, uh, uh, many of the, of the countries in, uh, in, in Africa. Also, every country in the world is still affected by uh, malnutrition. So as you can see here, even the US that at least one uh, type of burden of malnutrition is, is present in all countries uh, in the globe. So I think these are uh, some of the alar alarming statistics. And already having that, uh, we discussed last time when I was in Cornell about climate change, we did discuss also about the growing pop population and how we need to move to more circular agri-food systems. And I think today this is ever, ever, uh, ever more present. I mean, COVID will also kill with hunger and probably there may be going more uh, we may have more starvation than that than that's by the disease itself, just by having interrupted uh, and by having that as a shock. When we started to reflect about that in CIMIT, we said, what happens if we look at this as like a general repetition for many more shocks to come at the global level? And how can we then respond uh, to that? So that means it's time to take notice of the crisis and act. And uh, I took a reflection where I said, if uh, a very smart man uh, represented here, a novelist, if you want answers in science, you sometimes have to go to the arts. And this artist said, if you do not think about the future, you cannot have one. And if we think in that sense, then we need to look into thinkers, in fu into future thinkers. And what is future thinking? And future thinking you can do by looking at trends, right? We are very comfortable in the academia by making projections and models. But you can also look at events. Are there events that we see in the past that actually paint the future? On the other side, you can have theories and, and, and make many uh, theories which are usually ingrained in, 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 a, in a worldview. But there's also methods to predict the future or to look at the future, let's say not predict, to look at the future. And in the middle of all that, we can paint an image of that future. And that future will have processes and it will have content. So if we look at that, I started reading up and discussing with uh, experts in uh, scenario planning and in, in developing scenarios of the future. So those of you that are interested in reading a bit more after hearing this presentation, I can refer you to works from MIT or uh, excellent work by Adam Kayan or excellent work, of course, by Rafael Ramirez, a well-known professor from Oxford related to strategic thinking from uh, uh, scenario planning. And scenario planning starts from the concept that it is a very useful tool that you can paint scenarios if you are in tuna and tuna is not a fish. Tuna is the abbreviation for unpredictable and uncertainty, ambiguity, novelty, and turbulence. So especially when we are in times of uncertainty, of novelty, of turbulence, and ambiguity, these methods of scenario planning and scenario painting uh, may be very, very useful. So scenario is not strategy, but strategy can come from scenario. And why is scenarios then important? Because the future is paradoxical by definition. It is very difficult to predict and even more dif difficult to predict the future. So uh, the future has not taken place yet. It is upcoming, it's oncoming, it's forthcoming, it's inevitable, it's coming, it's impending, it's imaginable. It all depends on how you are from your present looking at that future. Future is also hoped for, awaited for, expected, but it can also be feared, dreaded, imagined and looked for. 
So actually the future is always in the present and it is not factual. So in that sense, it's very dif difficult to predict because scenarios are not predictions. Scenarios are not projections, they're not forecasts, they're not preferences, there are no models. Scenarios are uh, uh, surfaces and question model assumptions. So they're not counterfactual. <laughs> models. So what I try to see here is what we do with scenarios is going for the uh, is going for something that is possible that may happen that is a reference frame but we are not trying to say will it happen like this exactly and to what magnitude will it happen so scenario planning is not the same as contingency planning when we were reporting when we were responding to the covid crisis in simit we identified three phases phase one was deliver we need to keep delivering our project our project portfolio and our work that is contingency we also looked at phase two, which is contribute. How can we take some of the elements that we produce day to day, some of our science, some of our knowledge, and can it contribute to mitigate the impacts of the, uh, of the measures taken to control COVID? And last but not least, we uh, started phase three, which we called shape the future. And it's for this shape the future effort that we used the scenario planning method. Scenario is not a strategy, but informs strategic thinking. And scenario planning can be taken to be an ongoing iterative inquiry, not a one-off project. So we made those scenarios. How will the agri food system look like in 2025 in a plus COVID world, in a world where we have learned to deal with COVID? And probably we have to do that reiteratively as new information comes available. So there's some pro and cons on using scenario uh, planning or scenarios. It links different st strategies and it promotes flexible thinking. Decision makers can scope out uh, and can uh, develop interdisciplinary co cooperation. During our effort, we included Cornell professors, but also so uh, sociologists, but also people in the field, farmers and technicians, they all were part of this effort. It can be refined and reiterated, and it's also very useful for non-for-profit organizations, and it's very versatile. It also has cons. Those of you that like quantitative information will not find a lot of that in the scenarios. It can be times consuming, and it's often difficult to put data behind it. And it reduces, obviously, complexity, which increases risks of being wrong about the potential scenario. It can apply it in multiple worlds from political and economic decision-making processes, all the way down to crisis management, risk management, corporate development, and it can help to create uh, future co corporate models or thinking models. And it is very useful for development, innovation, and research. And let this be exactly the business we're in here. We want to do global development through innovation and research and invest in the right, no regret uh, actions. So if we are at time number one, what we try to do with uh, uh, scenario planning and the development of scenarios is looking for uh, pro uh, plausibility, not probability. So we are not in the business of saying how probable is this, we are in the business of saying how plausible is this. So this means from the time where we are, we want to paint a picture and this picture is probably this one here. And then we choose a couple of scenarios on the possibilities projected from the time where we are. Or you have a funnel, right? You have a scenario A and a scenario B, which is which is coming at us from that future thinking. Obviously, with COVID, there is a more important thing, or with a shock, shock or a crisis, as I said, we saw this as a, a, general, a general trial, a global tryout for a global shock. So we were coming from our past with certain trends. We have empirical data, we have past performance information and we reached our present, present and all of a sudden we has a, had a discontinuity. We had a disruptor which disrupts the trajectory we were on. And that actually scatters like light would scatter on the, on the crystal, the different options where we could uh, land and the different scenarios where we could end up. 
So scenarios as a tool to be strategic is about assumptions, plausibility, purposeful, usefulness. It's about the context and you do it for someone, you do it for a certain purpose. It needs to be useful. It needs to frame thinking and it's dynamic. So it's not about data and predictions per se. You can use data and predictions. It's not about preference. It's not about oneself. It is for, it's not for anyone. It is for someone. And it's not about truth. It's about uh, thinking and a framework. And so your scenarios uh, need to be coherent stories that describe a small set of plausible futures and context and how they may come about. So like I said, it has a, have a purpose for someone, for a specific purpose, for a certain situation and an intended outcome. And they can be used for an enabling, for enabling creativity all the way up to making decisions and all what is in between. So it can be exploratory and it can be in, uh, in a decision making uh, tool. Very important in making the scenarios, we need to look at what is coming towards us as well as what is going to, happen, going to happen, me going forward, as well as those things that are catching up from the past. To give you an example, what is coming towards this is probably climate change. But you can also imagine that an event that happened in the past can catch up or the impact of it can catch up. And in those two processes, we are moving forward. So the question is, which factors will be the red ones? What will be coming at us? and which factors will catch us in the future. Question always is how far in time should we go? And obviously when you have a, an event like COVID, you can best, uh, I don't know if you have noticed, but our future became more present. It's more difficult to think farther down the, down the, down the line of time. It has been more difficult to think to, to about 2030 if we don't even know if we will be able to travel a month from now. So obviously the, the future has come a bit closer to our present uh, today. We started our scenario by thinking, where are we? What is our transactional environment? And what is our contextual environment? And we want to set our scenarios between, where we, uh, between the transactional environment that we can influence and the contextual environment that we have to take and that comes uh, at us. Because in our us, we co fully control. Our transactional environment, we influence and we co-design. And our contextual environment, we can only survey and appreciate. And there's obviously influ influencing factors on all those environments. There's the economy, there are technological factors, there are legal factors that shape our contextual and our transactional environment. There are environmental factors and social cultural norms. All of those were taken into account in the exercise. And we decided to develop four plausible scenarios on a grid of uh, uh, extremes. And you can do different things, but that's the one that we uh, decided to design for. And you need a good storyteller in order to make your scenarios. So we all sat on around the virtual campfire and we made a good story about each of those scenarios. When looking at the current, we got some tips from Oxford University and they said stretch plausibility because panic is no longer just for the poor or for the dis disadvantaged. We, we, panic is there in all of us now. Consider shorter time horizon as uh, change has changed. And tuna is not something you need to worry about because it's clearly there. We are in full tuna. Uh, and as, I, as you remember, tuna is not the fish, but it's about turbulence, uncertainty, novelty. So the world is looking for you guys in tuna conditions and in where we are today, the world is more than ever looking for leadership and you will not deny that. And if you're looking for leadership, the task of a leader is to manage ambiguity, to mobilize action and to store highly accurate knowledge about their environment. The more effective way to improve performance of a company of an endeavor is to invest in how leaders shape their interpretive outlooks. And this comes from Harvest Business Review. And on the one hand, leaders should be positive about opportunities, but on the other hand, they shouldn't be overly confident in their ability to control. So perhaps this, the secret of good leadership lies in how you manage the, the curious and blend of pessimism and optimism. So when I saw this slide and I was thinking about uh, this seminar, that's when I decided to tell you the story about the scenario planning that we did. 
because I think it's you young leaders in, Ox uh, in uh, Cornell University that have to become those leaders that blend in pessimism and optimism by realism about the future. So our scenarios in that sense are not the end. They are the beginning for the learners. And so I want to offer them to you to start learning from them and try applying them so you can listen to this crisis. You can lead the country where it needs to be, your community, and especially you can leap forward toward a better world. So now let's get started. What we did is we mapped actors and factors. We developed a system map. We identified key drivers and then we developed the scenario matrix. So we started by scoping out our project. We made a system map by 300 uh, respondent survey. We developed a scenario matrix and we explored our future. We developed our future scenarios and we're now in the process of exploring what those scenarios may mean. So I also have a fairly self selfish objective here, which is hear from you. What do you think that those scenarios can mean uh, in the future uh, for you? And what would be things then for us to do? So we received input from over 300 researchers, advisors, technicians, also technicians or field workers, uh, managers, higher up, project directors and coordinators, uh, country representatives and, and, and uh, part of the management. So uh, all from different organizations and, and, and from, different, uh, from different units. And we mapped with that our where are we sitting and this was from a CIMIT perspective but you, you can imagine this applies also a little bit uh, to Cornell we are about funding we are about capacity building we are about crop development better agronomy research for development in our transactional world where we want to influence it's about food insecurity household resilience agricultural inputs and then a bit farther there is the context of conflict privacy and data, food loss and waste, food and agricultural uh, innovations, climate change and land degradation. So we made this whole map. And we asked 300 people, what is the event that you see that generates the biggest impact and the biggest uncertainty if you look at the future? And so to, we grouped those on this grid and what clearly came out is yes, climate change, but climate change is something we cannot do right now much about it's something that's a given if you see what i mean so we took that out of our scenarios what we did put in the scenarios was the ones here global governance and polit political instability and the other one here was the policy response to COVID, which can lead to unemployment and economic uh, uh, recession is also sitting here so this gave us four scenario two drivers one drivers on the one extreme was a severe economic downturn the other one is stabilization of the economic disruptions. On the other axis, we put with governance and stabilization of political structure and the rule of law. I, I know this is a bit uh, a loaded term today, but what I mean is it's the it's the it's the structural political structure governance. It doesn't mean uh, uh, how that is exerted. The creation of efficiency of governance of reinforced reinforced by challenges of political stability. So it's about governance, not governance, government. No, it's about the governance and the rules of how we uh, work uh, between each other. So on those extremes, you can see, you can identify four scenarios and one we called protectionism with a severe economic downturn and but the uh, resurgence of governance, we probably go into protectionism. If we have a severe economic downturn and we have a decrease in governance and stability, we may have a global decline. If we have stable economic disruptions, but the decrease in efficiency of governments, we go over towards the new local. And if we have resurgence of governance, stabilization of political structures and, and, and rules, and we have a stabilization of the economic disruption, we could go to a green, what we call a green evolution. So in the first uh, in the first one to look at what is the protectionism uh, scenario it's a scenario that where we said agri food systems are slow and rigid with limited innovation the economic crisis deepens levels of poverty and inequality reversing reversing development gains and uh, gains towards the sdgs everywhere except in some regions they, they are able to weather the crisis better than others 
So this protectionism scenario is uh, we are we will be, we would we will be faced by 2025 with a deep economic crisis. Governing bodies work to preserve their social political power and order, with limited agreement at global level and regional coordination bodies become increasingly pro prominent. And the historically most powerful lobbies maintain their influence and resources, and area food systems are slow, rigid, with limited information. Innovation, sorry. And how do we know if this scenario is unfolding? The indicators we identified is that poverty levels will increase, especially in those already fragile areas, rapidly escalating levels of inequality, increased level of state regulation for many industries, high barriers to entries, and increased rates of migration, mostly regional. Obviously, we have seen some of this protectionism scenario unfolding. If you look at uh, what is happening with the vaccine, where every country seems to run for their own. If you go down in this quadrant and we go to the global decline, this is where the COVID depression drives political instability, nationalism, and further challenges to the rule of law. The needs of vulnerable people es escalate, and especially agri-food systems are chaotic, easily disrupted, and totally unstable. So in this scenario, we see increases in nationalism and a reduction in government spending, decreasing the efficiency of governing institutions. The protracted economic crisis results in recurrent episodes of civil unrest as unemployment and corresponding increases in levels of poverty and food insecurity drive disorder. And agri-food systems are chaotic, easily disrupted, and unstable. This is one where you would see indicators uh, of many core countries having to repeatedly impose national level of lockdowns, limiting movement of goods and people. Rates of unemployment and underemployment re remain significantly higher than pre-2019 the interruption and over the course of the outlook. Rates of poverty dramatically increase and household debt is a as a household debts are escalating, and there is an increased adoption of nationalist policies by mainstream political parties. So these would be the indicators, and you can look around yourself if you have seen some of those indicators in some countries going towards the global decline. If you go to the other quadrants, we come to the new local. This is where disruption within uh, uh, with an agenda, campaigns for equ uh, equality and localized solutions take place. Agri-food systems are not resilient, but they're very short and very efficient because we have a, data, a stabilization of the socioeconomic disruption, but we have decreasing efficiency of governance. In this scenario, the COVID-19 revealed and exacerbated sorry, the deep inequalities that define society, resulting in prolonged challenges to political stability. It's an undermining of the rule of law and the renewed national focus that diminishes the force and the efficacy of global governing institutions. And agri-food systems are not resilient, but they're efficient locally. They're very embedded in local context and as longer systems require more effective governance system, systems and procedures, they make the, 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 short, they make the, the supply chain change short. Do we see what would be the indicators for this uh, scenario to unfold? There are no more national level lockdowns. So restrictions on movement are min uh, limited to localized areas. Social movements see an increase in membership funds and there's a sustained, sustained presence of in-person prote protests. The economic situation stabilizes while growth doesn't return to, to pre-2019 levels for several years. The economic, uh, the global economy overall moves from contraction to stagnation. And rates of poverty increase, but do not continue to increase at the same rate over the co course of the outlook. So in this new local, we see pockets of hope. If you go to the next quadrant, we are in the green evolution. And in this green evolution, cooperation, especially at regional level, return, returns life to as normal as possible. And the green recovery is prioritized by some regions and industries. Here, agri-food systems are resilient, resilient and moving away a bit from efficiency and flexible through data-driven decisions, decision making and, uh, uh, and taking. So in this green evolution scenario, the intense economic disruptions which followed the 2020 COVID emergency is a unifying event in which results uh, that results in increased cooperation, particularly at regional level, to stabilize the economy. 
In this scenario, many regions take the opportunity to build back a greener, more sustainable food system, including a shift to integrated management. And IV food systems are resilient and flexible with data-driven decisions underlying and making the most out of short supply chains that are efficiently and resiliently connected. What would be the indicators for such a green evolution? Evolution. This would be a scenario in which we have an effective and moderately accessible coordinated COVID vaccine. Intensification of regional trade. There would be an increasing discourse at national policy level and international on the need to be more climate conscious at the adoption of green policies in the recovery. And government spending on social safety nets increases, limiting the number of people falling below the poverty line over the course of the outlook. So of course, none of those scenarios may happen or all of them may happen at the same time. One may happen uh, more strongly or another one may uh, happen less strongly. But in the end, the future is what we make and shape. So it will be up to us to see how we can actually go into one of those future scenarios, one of those probable uh, 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 sorry, one of those uh, plausible scenarios that can uh, uh, unfold and how do we, we get there. So the next step in the team was how can we support going towards one of those scenarios and how can we actually mitigate some of the impacts of the other scenarios that we don't uh, favor. So basically, what are the no regret investments or what are the things we can do that are actually good in any scenario unfolding? And this is where we took our, all our information and mapped it together and uh, came to the conclusion that integrated development of sustainable agri-food systems that actually start from the nutrition and the food security would be a response. The way we set up this effort was saying we have a crisis or a need in the agri-food systems. And for they, those we want the value proposition where we start from healthy diets that can actually have country implications and where we can now map uh, from our future scenarios, a trajectory of where we are today and where we want to be tomorrow. And it's this trajectory that will inform and inspire activities at short, long and medium, at short, medium and long term, and that need to be connected to specific indicators to see if we are still on course and that still need to respond to our sustainable development goals. It has given us in Simi the opportunity to work with our traditional partners in this effort, to identify different partners and to identify new partners. We didn't know they even existed, but we know now that we need them. As an example, we developed an effort which is called Crops for Country Initiatives that are sitting now at the level of the Office of the President and where we are of the country of Mexico and where we are discussing with the public sector, the private sector and the social sector, how we can actually implement this effort. It's an effort that's mapped along the value chain from healthy and affordable diets going to targeted breeding, biodiversity uh, conservation, seed systems and input by service providers going to sustainable climate resilient systems that are inclusive for local development and that integrate uh, several uh, innovations uh, that can increase the carrying capacity of uh, that, are, that are, can help to stay within the carrying capacity of earth and environment. It's about self-consumption for those families that eat their own, their, their own production, but it's also a supply for trade where we move now into the contextual environment of local markets and national global uh, uh, traders, where we are uh, seeing markets and agro industry, we need to work with retail and with consumers. It is driven by traceability and sustainability indicators, by collaborative research and the development of suitable technologies and practices, and we need research, public policy and private sector. We need, it's, we need concepts of rural employment, public health, extension systems, food and trade regulation, inclusive economic growth, and scaling strategies along this pathway. And consumers will drive and inform several steps, starting from the healthy diet back to the consumer and from the consumer back to the healthy diet. Today, we made an advance of where we implement and redirect the innovation system that we have implemented in Mexico, where we installed research platforms throughout the country, innovation sites uh, on site with farmers side by side, and then innovation practices, which we measure through citizen science 
uh, by uh, measuring what farmers are doing in their fields. And above of that is the network of stakeholders. And it's in this setting that we will now inject those scenarios so that we can have conversation not only on the national level, but also on the local level. And of course, this is very similar. We want to hear how we can learn from experiences like uh, farmer networks that uh, uh, Rebecca has been presenting to us, and we hope to keep that conversation. I'm putting this context here because this is the context of which we can have many conversations, many Cornell uh, researchers that can contribute to this effort. In numbers, we start started in 2019 from uh, uh, over 1 million hectares that we are working with, over 800 sites for adaptation and validation, over 42 million uh, geo-referenced innovation sites, and 12 agroecologies. So it's in this setting that we want to do this effort of an integrated program and then replicate it elsewhere uh, in the world. We're looking at Africa and we're looking at South Asia, where we have similar uh, uh, programs like CISA, for which I know um, uh, Cornell is heavily, heavily, heavily involved. And last but not least, a uh, system has been set up for monitoring and data management strategies where we map from the SDGs all the way through uh, the uh, agri-food system and uh, we have now operating uh, online uh, scorecards for companies that so they know which uh, grain they are buying, but also sustainability dashboards per project to see how the different implementations can go. And those will now be mapped to uh, those in scenarios and the indicators within the scenarios. So last but not least, we think that from this whole effort, we can start a coalition of the willing that we called agriculture for healthy diets, agriculture for peace, because the post-COVID world could be one in which we can rethink the way we eat, live, grow, and build our lives. So it's the, an invitation that we develop this coalition uh, where we can work together by listening to this crisis, look at the future scenarios, leap forward by leading by example and learning while we will be doing this. Because for sure, we know we will make mistakes but I think together we can adjust the scenarios and even from the mistakes, learn for the future. So the future is not written. Let's build one that is sustainable, resilient and inclusive. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bram. Uh, very stimulating, provocative talk. Uh, let's open it up now. Uh, as usual, I'll watch the uh, chat box uh, along with Dr. Buck. And uh, uh, so if you have questions, feel free to put them there or, or raise your hand. Uh, um, so any, any questions now, just go ahead. I don't, I don't see any hands raised, but uh, anyone that wants to ask a question, just un unmute yourself and, and go ahead. Yeah, hello. Let me jump in. Hello, Ram. This is Johannes. Hi, Johannes. Uh, nice see you. Time. Even if we really love to have you in person here, um, and uh, hopefully that happens soon. Sometimes. Yeah. Thank you very much for this great talk. I I was wondering. Um, we, uh, you definitely uh, came through very strongly in reaching out to the academic community and 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 uh, seeing their their value as a partner. Um, uh, and specifically Cornell, and I think that is really, really great. Um, I, I'm wondering, um, our, our disciplines are by necessity and, and maybe sometimes by default, uh, very cautious in, in going out on a limb and, and advocating. Uh, very often we're not even allowed to do that, um, but, uh, but uh, resort to, yeah, it depends and, and we don't know and we need no more research. Uh, whereas you are tasked with actually coming up with solution and trialing them. Um, ha have you seen uh, a, an emergent roadmap how, how um, we can overcome these, these different incentive structures and, and behaviors um, and, and, uh, and work together a, a little bit more effective than we have in the past? Yeah, th thanks, Johannes. And I think this is, a, this is an, an, excellent, an excellent question. And First thought is I think already the solution lies in the way you are you are recognizing the problem, right? So I think by putting forward that there's probably two 
two cultures, so to say, we come from, where, 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 where I live in a world where we are pressured constantly by, okay, what is the solution to put forward, uh, or where, where you have access to, to, to a decision maker, a secretary of agriculture, who says, uh, well, all, all fine, but just tell me what to do. Um, uh, and why versus the academia that's more looking at, at, at the data and maybe it only works in these circumstances under these conditions uh, when, the, when, the, when, when this is fulfilled, right? But I do think we can make an interface because if you look at the setup that I presented here, there is a space that's very well controlled and where we can do the academic work and it's out of that academic research that you can then extract probably drivers, right? You can extract some some concepts and 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 and, and drivers that you then uh, can allow the other be now calling insights, but then you can allow the other side to actually comfortably plug into those scenarios. So you can actually I can actually imagine that the relevance of some of the research you do in a current context it could be a nice exercise to say what is the relevance of this in each of those four scenarios. And I think you may, you may come actually to a conclusion that you don't have to do your work differently, but that the, the relevance of the work becomes very different or the, the ramification of the work becomes very different. So I think if, if I actually hope that uh, this kind of tools like the scenario planning can make us more comfortable to have that conversation by, by having the liberty to, 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 to be okay to be wrong because nothing is right because it's possible within those four options, if, if, if you see what I mean. So that was a bit why I did this talk in this way, to open actually the possibility of, of, of that conversation as you open the possibilities within that thinking frame uh, that, that I tried to put forward. I, I, and I don't have the full response, but I hope that provokes a bit of that. And I can also, a scientist can see and students and academia that there may be a spot in this, in this line that I presented from, from diet to consumer, there may be a specific space where you, we, you want to position yourself to increase visibility and understanding of what is happening in that piece while you understand that there's other pieces that, that, that are flowing to that. Does, does that make sense? I, I hope that responds a bit to the question. So I think we're on a similar quest, quest, search and I hope this is part of the response to that, to that mm -hmm. search. Yeah, and, and then these are very big questions, right? You're, you're putting up up uh, something that is beyond anyone, or at least my my perception of knowing all the moving parts and 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 seeing um, people like myself that are are working on, let's say, how much nitrogen should I put on in, in this big framework is is uh, is really daunting and and intimidating. Uh, so, so it, it probably requires some handholding on on your part for the academic world um, to to see themselves adding value to something that big when when each of us is working that small. Yeah, sure. So uh, let me make something very, 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 very concrete in that sense. Uh, for example, I was mentioning those fifty research platforms. So it basically means that we have now fifty sites where you have eight different agronomic practices. So it would be great to, to, to just concretely, not just by what you mentioned, say, why don't you come and measure nitrogen efficiency in eight of those sites and something will come out and then we will in, be able to embed this in a contextual and in a context, be it agroecological or, or uh, to actually better understand why is it different in those eight sites. And that's it, that's already a huge contribution to, to this whole setup, I, I hope this makes sense. Or uh, uh, a, a nutritious diet will probably emerge because we, we need more zinc. So that could actually be then uh, work to say, okay, starting point could be to look at the grain with increased zinc content. Uh, but then let's, let's, let's develop it, but then we have the possibility to see, does this actually end up in the increased zinc later on i mean things like that asking a company what is your parameter for quality and then we can go back and, and we will not bother you for a couple of years to come and come up for with the, with the right uh, quality so the way we see this is kind of this top level frame and then each of those disciplines can stream individual elements within this bigger frame and that will require a conversation which is basically 
but you don't have to worry about the coordination because the frame is there. You have to do what you're good on in, in your particular piece because that's what's going to make a difference. Uh, Bram, uh, Terry here. You you use the term uh, innovation throughout your your talk, and uh, of course there's been a you know a major move in the last many years away from uh, uh, research that's uh, driven uh, simply by the initiative of scientists and research institutions and in delivered uh, to a, a much more complex. Uh, uh, and sometimes messy process of networks of actors working together. Could you talk a little bit about what that's looked like at, at CIMIT and, and, uh, and what have been the uh, benefits and potential downsides of that move? Yeah. For sure. Thanks. I mean, um, first, first of all, uh, I think one of the main learnings have been it is not an either or, and it's not an all or nothing. So um, we cannot do this broader frame if we don't have a breeder that day by day go to the field and selects the best plants and develops the next variety. If that breeder needs to worry about all these big system elements, he will be probably very distracted and not get the next potential variety. So it is rather saying, it's rather putting that activity of that individual breeder and allowing it to be connected to this broader system thinking and this innovation network uh, than the other way around and create a feedback loop of information that is useful for him. And that is, I think, a learning from having to, to try to do it in CIMIT. CIMIT was a, a, a breeding organization known for developing specific seeds for maize and wheat with specific characteristics. Oh, uh, today, 50% of our investment goes in those kind of activities. The other 50% go in more system innovation networks, etc. But those innovation networks cannot work without those single intervention technologies, a new machine, a new seed. So we cannot make this work if we take it from a, a, a frame of opposition. Where, where, the, where, the, where one is opposed to the other. It's rather a function that one has in the, in the other and vice versa. So uh, a variety becomes successful because it has taken into account the other elements around it and the other elements around it can, can make an innovation network because there is a variety to plug in, something like that. And sorry to focus it on variety, but that's the part I'm most comfortable with. Uh, another learning is you have to accept that complex research networks are very inefficient and they cost uh, time, money, collaboration costs. Collaboration is not for free. So you have to be upfront by putting that cost there and being comfortable with that cost. Uh, individual work may be more efficient, uh, but it may not give you the ability to, to respond to complex problems. So you have to be very cautious and conscious about the pros and cons. And I think the conclusion, it's not an either or. Uh, if we all go to system thinking, we will also end very soon by, by not moving anything and just being lost in complexity. You're in mute, I think, Terry. Sorry for that. Still in mute, sorry. <laughs> sorry, OK. No worries. We, we uh, thank you for that, Bram. Uh, we have a question from uh, uh, one of our other participants, uh, Jesse Hughes. Jesse, would you like to uh, pose the question yourself rather than filter it through me? Mm. Uh, you'll have to unmute yourself, Jesse. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Bram, for such a detailed presentation. Um, I was looking at your models and it looks like ones that planners use for vulnerability prediction and resilience of cities. Um, I was wondering if there were existing models that you drew on to make these ones, like if there were existing ones for socioeconomic or agricultural predictions. And um, were there any results that surprised you or were you mostly in surprise with the feedback you got? Yeah. 
Uh, thanks, thanks for the question. Uh, so I think it's actually two questions, and I will try to, yeah. to be sharp. Um, yes, of course, we did we we, we did draw from a, a global call it uh, a, well no, no global in the sense of the of the scope of the of a, of the review. So we made a global review of existing models and predictions and 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 so to know what is out there. Uh, but that was in order to be able to extract the drivers. And so especially, the, and I didn't mention it here, there was a series of seminars that were just to provoke thought. And so several uh, Cornell colleagues uh, participated in those, uh, in those seminars, but also others. We had CEOs, venture capitalists, ac academia, uh, CIMIT scientists. So we used, yes, those models were used, but as an input stream, not as something that was driving towards any of the scenarios. And I think right now you can turn it around and you could take a scenario, extract the drivers and plug them into your models, if you see what I mean. So that's an interesting academic exercise which, which, which could happen. There were many uh, surprising uh, elements. I was very surprised about how in 24 hours we got 300 respondents. So it, it, really, it really clearly touched the sour point uh, that people were willing in the midst of the crisis. This was on March, April to take time to respond to questionnaires. So that I was very surprised. Um, other surprising elements uh, that, that, that for sure came out is this, this, this conflict or marriage between resilience and efficiency and how that actually can potentially drive this inequality. So I think that the importance of the element of inequality as a starting point to respond or not adequately to a crisis for me was a big learning. It was not something I was thinking of how this COVID crisis actually, or the crisis or the shock actually um, is, and, and the impact of the shock is heavily influenced by inequality. Uh, so that was something I, 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 I would not have seen if it wasn't for this, for this exercise. Great, thank you so much. Okay, we are uh, out of time, but uh, thank you so much, Bram. We really uh, uh, appreciate your being with us today. Uh, I, I will note that uh, Bram had uh, planned to spend uh, a few days with us here in Ithaca. Uh, he, was, he was on campus last uh, winter uh, or fall, and, and uh, we started the, the planning uh, at that time. And uh, obviously, uh, uh, things didn't work out for him to travel here uh, in person, but uh, we look forward to hosting you in uh, hopefully the not too distant future. So thank, thanks so much for being with us. Welcome, and it will be my pleasure to, to be with you in, in, in real life as soon as possible. And in the meantime, feel free to send any email, any follow up, and I will share when we have uh, the final version, I will share the document of the, the, of the four scenarios for, for, for you to look at it, and then we can we can continue the conversation. That that would be great. Also, if uh, if you'd be willing to uh, uh, let us uh, post your PowerPoint just on our course uh, Canvas site, so uh, we can spend a little more time examining it. Yep, and, absolutely. Uh, uh, you can just send it uh, to me in uh, in Dropbox or Box or s something like that. I will do. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for taking time to listen. Thank, take and, uh, care. Have a lovely afternoon. Take care. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.